Thank you, Larry. I uh, should have emailed you and asked you to keep expectations low. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I failed to do that. Um, thank, you, thank you very much for the invitation. When I looked at the list of uh, previous uh, people who previously lectured um, in this series, I, I was in awe. I thought, my God, how is it that I'm on the list? How can it be possible? And then I realized, once in a lifetime, it's not about me. It's about the subject. And I just happen to be uh, an expert in this field, so that's how I got on the distinguished list. And I thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, I also want to talk about um, several people in the audience that I know, too. Um, I would like to acknowledge Leila McMullen, an attorney um, at my office, um, at Pennsylvania Law Firm from Kansas City. Leila is an immigrant herself as well. She came from Argentina at the age of 12, didn't speak a word of English, and uh, ended up <coughs> being one of the best immigration attorneys in Kansas as well. Um, um, went to KU, not to K-State, sorry. <laughs> Just because KU has a law school and K-State still doesn't. Um, also want to acknowledge uh, Kimberly Corum out there. Um, a wonderful immigration attorney right here in Manhattan and a fearless um, advocate for um, immigrant rights. Um, I have a lot of respect for her and uh, she um, could help us if we have questions I can't answer <laughs> here. Why do they come? I'm going to ask, I'm going to give you a lot of answers and suggestions today. Also, I'm going to ask a lot of questions. <laughs> And because it's 7.30 and probably you just had dinner, um, I'm going to spice it up in the following manner. Uh, I'm going to, this is a university after all, I'm going to give you quizzes. And if uh, um, you are not awake after dinner, I'm going to bribe you for, with prizes. Prizes consist of the aforementioned cookbooks of superior quality that I wrote with my clients. <laughs> As well as um, uh, not so, you know, not this. This is less superior quality. This is a book by Leila McMullen, and it's less superior because it doesn't have any pictures. It's just blah 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 blah. Just, just. But it's wonderful as well. It's questions and answers on immigration law. So, for uh, if you get it right, you get the fabulous cookbook. If you get it wrong, you get Leila's book. <laughs> if your answer is super fabulous, you get both. So participate. Why do they come? Anybody? Opportunity. All right. Um, Sam? Future. Future for their kids. Future for their kids. Yes, very, very much so. Anything else? Love. Love, yes. You know, in fact, I, I'm always surprised. You know, half of the clients in my uh, uh, lobby are always hugging and can't get their hands off of each other. Love is a very big factor in immigration in this country. Anything else? Education, yes. You know, we are known to have a very good system of education here, and a ton of people come to go to our wonderful universities, such as K-State, which, as soon as I appeared on campus, they told me, why are you wearing red? <laughs> Mistake. Should have been purple. <laughs> very good. Anything else? Yes. Refugees. refugees come. Very good. Um, and uh, uh, why do they come to the state? Very good. Any other reason? No. All those who just answered, raise your hands because Layla is going to give you fabulous cookbooks because <laughs> all answers were right. Okay. Where do they come from? You know, because what I hear in, in, in hearings is, um, oh, they're all Mexicans, you know. And uh, some of them are Mexicans. Anywhere else? All over the world. All over the world, yeah. Do you know anyone who came from somewhere? Yes. Yes, Australia, very good. Yes, yes. Israel, yes. 
Spain, very good. Guatemala. Uzbekistan, amazing, yes, wonderful. You know the food is amazing. Have you eaten Uzbek food? Very good, yeah. My next cook will, will include some Uzbek food. It's amazing, yes, okay. And some people come legally, and some, lo and behold, come illegally. My question is, why or why do they come illegally? We understand legally, you know, you just get your visa and you cross the border and you are told welcome in some cases. And in other cases, you, you know, get yourself in a container and uh, get yourself smuggled through the border or you crawl through a sewer or you um, hide inside a belly of a sheep. Uh, why would you do such a thing? Why do they come illegally? Any idea? Yes, sir. Right, or in, in any manner, you know, we have uh, a client from Somalia whose, whose family, wife, children, parents, and a cat was killed right before his eyes, and he was then in a camp, uh, in, a, in a refugee camp in Kenya, and the only, he told me the only way to get into the refugee program to go to America was to pay $5,000 to a United States official. And I said, you know, you've got to be kidding me. This is preposterous. What you're saying cannot be. And lo and behold, several weeks later, I, wrote, I read in a United Nations uh, publication that some people are actually going to jail for demanding bribes in Kenyan camps to put to people in the program. And if you don't have any money, and you don't have any money as a refugee, this, this may happen. Any other reasons why people come, come illegally? Right, they, they could be crawling through the border with a stash of drugs or some other horrible things. Yes, that happens as well. Any other? Uh, Economic opportunity, uh, that's a big incentive for people to, uh, because they don't have the same in their countries of origin and they have to have, uh, feed their families, pay for their housing, they leave their families behind and come to the <coughs> Well, Susanna, my question is why do they come illegally? Why don't they just go to the consulate, to the U.S. consulate in Ciudad Juarez or uh, Moscow or someplace else? Why don't they do it legally, Pam? Well, it just costs $5,000 to do that. They don't have the resources. They don't have... Maybe they don't know. Maybe they don't know. Maybe they don't know. Quotas. 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 What about it? What's your name, sir? Bob. Bob. What are you talking about? I know, outrageous. <laughs> and quotas, yes, we have very strict quotas on number of immigrants and we don't have nearly enough. And we're going to look at some of this today. Um, Marion? Right. So if, if my very good observation, my question though is if there was a way to do it legally, like where they could apply for a legal visa and come here legally versus crawling through the sewer and walking through the desert and dying every, you know, and dying, uh, would they choose to come and work legally or prefer to still do it illegally? Right. Right. Okay. So very interesting ideas here. We're going to just put it all on the table and try to untangle. Uh, those are all varied opinions out there, and we are going to try to take a stab at them. 
So my next question is here, what should we do? We have, um, by various uh, indications, anywhere from 11 million to 20 million illegal immigrants in this country. What should we do about this? Any ideas? You've got to have some ideas. <laughs> Gabriel, yes. Into legal. Well, Larry Weaver here thinks we need to give a pass to some sort of legal status. Um, any other ideas? Everybody agrees? Cannot be. Yes. In what you're saying it's a nightmare. In what way? That's a difficult one, yeah. And some people are having to struggle with their feelings about illegal immigration versus legal immigration. I see a lot of people making a very clear distinction here. Anybody wants to talk about uh, what sh we should do? In what? In what you name them? Nancy. How should we change the law? I've heard, yes, sir. Bob. And that's my point of view. You know, I, I, I would agree with that point of view more than with anybody else's because I've seen a lot of, uh, uh, of things not happening in the immigration field because we always look at this from the outside. You know, I had a big, huge argument with, with a legislator on Wednesday who told me, you know, there are so many people in the world um, and there are so many poor people in the world. We can't possibly uh, take all the poor people in the world and bring them to the United States, and I completely agree with it. What I don't agree with is that his, his, um, he, he completely doesn't include or exclude the United States out of the equation. We need to look at this, from my, in my view, from the point of view of what is good for the United States. And if we look at the facts, and we're going to look at some of them today, and decide that it is in our interest to have a better immigration policy, it is in our interest to have um, a, a, an orderly, legal way for people to come and work here or for families to be together without having to do something illegal and work under the table and crawl through the sewer, you know, under the, <coughs> under the border. Um, and we'll look at whether it is in our interest or not at all to increase or decrease immigration. Um, and what I'll try to do is, is, is to throw a lot of facts at you and let you decide and, and get out of here with your own opinion on things rather than engage in an emotional argument, which we always um, get engaged on immigration front. Before I do that, I want to read something to you. It's a quote from testimony by um, Eduardo Aguirre, who is um, former um, 
Director of United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. He testified in Congress and, and he was barraged by all these questions about immigration law. And he said, we are settled with, uh, with administering what my legal friends tell me is the most complicated set of laws in the nation. I am told it beats the tax code. And that goes to your comment where it is so complicated that it is worse than the tax law in this country in terms of how convoluted and complicated it is. And, and we, I always, when I give advice, I tell my clients, this advice applies to this particular situation for the, until tomorrow. Because tomorrow, if I read Federal Register in the morning on immigration, it may be something different. So it's valid until I read it again next morning. And it applies to a group of people in, in most cases, to two groups of people, to aliens and, <laughs> and Americans. It, uh, it applies to aliens and it's a problem it, that it's very, very complex because they are new, they don't know the laws of this country when they come here. When they cross the border, it is not the first thing that they, they do to read Federal Register and regulations on immigration law. And second of all, sometimes they don't even uh, speak the language. But yet all this law applies to them. And secondly, it applies to Americans. And that's a, even a bigger shock because uh, when Americans come to my office, and that will be the American spouse of a foreign national, for example, or an employer who wants to legally bring workers to the United States or who wants to set up a compliance program to comply with um, uh, verification requirements, uh, immigration requirements for, for its business. They are in a state of shock when I tell a sp an American spouse what they have to go through in order to obtain permanent residency, which is a, my pink green card, for their spouse, they uh, uh, sometimes they just storm out of my office, telling me, well, this, how can my government, you're just out of your mind. How can my government put me through this? Would you agree? Okay. You, you've been through this, so you know. And uh, uh, for the employers, they are in a state of shock as well because they thought that immigration law is something that applies to aliens, not to Americans and American businesses. And now it basically pretty much also applies to the whole public because under um, U.S. Patriot Act and, and various other acts, now we Americans have to prove to the driver license bureau that we are Americans. And um, sometimes, uh, uh, we see cases like in Colorado and Missouri where the U.S. passport per driver license bureau is not proof of U.S. citizenship and people get very upset about this and, and so it now kind of, we thought it's not about us while well, Congress kept legislating the aliens and every time that we think that it's not about us, it's about the aliens, let's not pay attention, it then comes and bites us unexpectedly from the privacy point of view, from the law point of view, uh, in case of employers, some of them go to jail. That's shocking. So let's look at some things here. Oh, by the way, this is where I come from. And uh, older generation out there, have you seen Dr. Zhivago? Yes, okay. And younger generation, it's just fabulous. And uh, <laughs> uh, but um, let's do some quizzes here. Uh, make sure you raise your hand and because this um, good prizes will follow. Quiz number one. In your opinion, so many percent of workers in the United States are foreign born. What's the percentage? Ten percent? A little up. Fifteen? Nineteen. What's your name? Adriana. Adriana, nineteen percent. Uh, obviously, we don't have exact figures, but uh, I trust the Pew Center of, uh, for Research, and they say 19% of our workers, in the, the economy in, as a whole, has 19% uh, of foreign-born workers. That's fairly shocking, because that means we have pretty much every fifth person who works in this country and who produces something. Um, 
not, that person doesn't come from here, may look a little differently and uh, may look a little different and may speak with an accent. They're kind of like me or a little different, but every fifth person who works out there is foreign born. When I learned about this, I was a little shocked. Isn't that shocking? And I don't think we realize that without looking at the numbers. <coughs> then uh, how many are illegal approximately? Chuck, yes, you're right there. It's uh, anywhere from 11 to 20 million, and I think it gets a cookbook label. <laughs> yes, so a, a huge number of those workers are in fact uh, undocumented. Well, what about this? Um, when you work, your employer, unless they're a crook, <laughs> takes uh, away employment taxes. And part of those taxes, who owns a business here? Can you? Yes. Yes, Bob. Anybody else? Oh, several business owners here. And as a business owner, I can tell you, when you pay your workers uh, their hard-earned money, you don't give them the whole paycheck. You take away a part of it, and you give a part of it to the state. And that part covers Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, and, and then you add your, a little bit of your own money and also send it to the federal government and the local government to cover um, other public services and expenses. Okay. Some undocumented workers um, work on fake documents. They don't have their own work permits. They don't have their green cards. They don't have their documents. So they purchase uh, a fake Social Security ID, uh, or ID number or ID somewhere else, and they give it to the employer. And the employer then um, treats them in the same manner um, as they treat everybody else, which is they take employment taxes out and they send them to the local government and to uh, the federal government. Um, I want to ask this question. Any idea, and, and then if the government cannot match the number, the stolen social security number, to the name of the person, there's a, uh, there's a so-called suspense file that the Social Security Administration keeps. Basically, this is the money that comes in but doesn't come out because they don't know who the person is. So the illegal immigrants pay into that system, but uh, because they're using fake documents, they are never going to get it back. So that's a suspense file. How much money do you think per year they are putting into that suspense file that we are going to use for our pension? Two billion. Two billion. No. <laughs> More. Seven billion dollars. Are you from Spain? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, basically, seven billion dollars a year uh, are, is being put in the system in unmatched funds, in addition to matched funds. And uh, currently, they have about 150 billion in, in the file, which uh, the hopes are that this will be used to prop up the Social Security for the aging population because apparently we're going to have a problem with it without that money. What about our unemployment rate? Any economists here or anybody who reads newspapers? Wait, wait, wait. Do you have a green card? Uh, do you have a, a, a cookbook yet? <laughs> Give him a cookbook. <laughs> Layla, he gave a fabulous answer. Give him your book as well. <laughs> He cheated? <laughs> Don't give him your book then. <laughs> All right. So um, what about the unemployment rate? I'm not, I'm not hearing the magic number. No, more than that. Less? Less? <laughs> Who said that? What's your name? Are you an e um, economics major? Just smart? OK. Ben, <laughs> 4.5, the latest number yesterday is 4.5. Now, uh, my degree is just in law, not in economics, but I'm as, just as smart as Ben. I read my research and I read my newspapers. And from what I read, um, 4.5 is where the, the um, unemployment rate kind of should be 
the economists say, to keep the economy moving, not to overheat, not to, not to underheat. And that also pretty much works uh, in the following manner. If you really want a job, not, not necessarily to your, uh, not necessarily your dream job. I, for example, want to be, uh, you know, teaching at Harvard. But if I would file for unemployment uh, based on inability to teach at Harvard, they'll laugh in my face. But if I'm unemployed, I can go and get a job, you know, I can open the Kansas City Star and there are about 400 jobs in the paper. So that's what 4.5 unemployment uh, means that, you know, maybe not fabulous jobs, but there are jobs out there for people who want to be employed. Now, what about this? Uh, Do you guys remember who Greenspan was? Huh? Ben, the smart one. Do you remember who Greenspan was? <laughs> Tell us who he was. Fed chairman, right. And see, in, in, because my undergrad wasn't teaching, Greenspan isn't green. <laughs> what did he say about immigration? Any idea? Ben, you're my only hope here. How about Kimberly? Okay, well, something similar to that. Basically, Greenspan used to go and testify um, in front of various committees um, um, in Congress, and he would always tell them things like, look, we had economic progress in the 90s, and the economy was hot and, and, and going strong thanks to immigrant labor. And Congress that usually does anything he says or used to say, that, you know, if he says, I think interest rates should go up a little bit. Interest rates go up immediately. They should go down a little bit. They immediately go down and things like that. When he told them about immigration, consistently every time when he would appear in front of, uh, in front of Congress, they basically didn't understand what he was saying or didn't want to. He also said that, look, we have a problem of aging population and we have Social Security and Medicaid and Medicare systems that are unsustainable. They are going to go bankrupt unless we have a major increase in immigration because the, he, the PhD people who worked for him in, in his various branches of the central bank keep telling him that immigrants come here when they're young, they come here to work, and they put a lot of money in terms of taxes into our Social Security system, um, and Medicaid and Medicare. What about Bernanke? Who is that guy in blue? Ben. Well, there you go. Per Ben, Bernanke is the current chairman of, of the Federal Reserve. And what is he saying about immigration? Now, understand, neither Greenspan nor Bernanke are um, lovers of immigrants per se. You know, they're not saying we should have poor people come here or we should be more kind or we should have more refugees. They are economists and they are in charge of making sure our economy is strong and we have the labor and we don't become a third world country. And they are in charge of making sure not all our jobs are uh, sent to China. That we keep some of them right here in the United States. So what is Bernanke telling Congress every time he goes there now? Yes, I'm surprised because Bernanke, I thought, is even more conservative in all kinds of policy um, than uh, uh, Greenspan. And he recently said, look, if we don't want our systems um, of uh, Social Security and Medicaid to go bankrupt, we must have at least 3.5 times as much immigration as what we have now. 3.5 times as much. Okay. All right. Um, so what we have is uh, the need, and, and the current level of immigration is about 1 million per year. Okay. He says we should have 3.5 million per year. Okay. Well, let's see how we do it. For example, um, in terms of, uh, and, and we have, 20 million working illegally in the jobs 
And at the same time, we have about 4.5 unemployment, which basically shows that all the jobs that are out there are either filled already or we have shortages and many industries are screaming for more people to work there and because they can't find them, they send them one of the factories to uh, outside of the country. Um, we are pretty much a service economy. Everything in terms of manufacturers that could have been outsourced is gone. 75% Seventy-five percent of our economy is services, not manufacturing. And uh, more and more manufacturing is, sent, uh, manufacturing is sent out. And now more and more services are being sent out of the country. And uh, well, what, about the, what are we doing in terms of immigration policy to make sure the jobs stay here? And we go back to what Bob said, kind of like, you know, can we look at it from the point of view of the United States? Bob's and mine point, what's good for this country? What's good for the United States? What are we doing? Well, in terms of keeping professionals, keeping the brainiacs in the United States, what are we doing there? Um, how many, do, you know, we have a, a, a category called H-1B visa for professionals. And how many of those do you think we allow to work in the United States per year in terms of granting new visas? Yes, ma'am. 66,000. I think actually it's even a little less, 65. But you were very close. 65,000. And I think last year they threw a bone to the um, academic community and gave us 20,000 more for people with master's degrees. So all in all, we have 80, 85,000 uh, visas for H1B brainiacs. Now, my H1B visas that come to me from employers such as universities and uh, uh, engineering firms and hospitals are this. It's usually some guy from India or China or sometimes from, um, from Europe and sometimes from Mexico who either graduated number one is a woman who graduated very often number one in his or her class who has straight A's, who's participated in everything and it's just amazing. It looks like the, 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 the person didn't do anything but study, study, study in the United States. Now, when the quota for H-1B visa opens on April 1, those visas are usually gone. Last year, for example, we were done in five weeks. On May 26, we reached the quota, which meant that for the rest of the year, we had zero H-1Bs available to colleges, universities, hospitals, schools, engineering firms, computer firms to hire out of the pool of brilliant foreign kids who come here, study, become first in their class. They are not welcome here. That is what the, this immigration policy tells them. Bill Gates, uh, several days ago, went and pled with Congress. He said, what are you doing? What are you doing? This is our brain drain on the world. These kids are here. They spent five, six, seven years in, in our universities. They paid <laughs> international tuition fees, which is three times as much. The universities love them. You know, there you go, my notes. And now that they are acculturated, they are totally American inside, and they've proven that they're some of the best in uh, their class. And the employers are willing to jump through the hoops and pay outrageous amounts of money in filing fees. To file for an H-1B will cost an employer $3,190. Then on top, legal fees, which is my fees, I'm not going to tell you, also horribly much. <laughs> And, and they have to jump through the hoops and they don't even know whether the worker is going to get one of those coveted visas. Why this policy is there, I don't know. I don't understand it and I don't understand why uh, we allow this as Americans. Those are very desirable immigrants uh, who need to stay here because our society will be better for them. Instead, 
We basically educate them, and then we throw them away. Who picks them up? Countries like Germany, who has an open door policy for brainiacs, and who would love to have an American educated computer scientist with years of ex excellent education and experience come and work in Germany to give an advantage, a technological advantage to Germany. Or many of my Indian clients who've had it tell us, you know what, we're going back to Bangalore. We're going back where we're welcome, where they tell us, you know, you're welcome, you, we will do whatever it takes to welcome you back into the Indian economy. And the Indian economy is now booming. Understand also what an H-1B has to go through. You come here, you may even bring your wife here, the wife is, or husband, the spouse is not allowed to work. You start from scratch, from zero, from nothing. You don't have a spoon from with which to eat your soup with your H-1B uh, beginning. And they come, still come. Okay, what about H-2Bs? Those are our seasonal workers. And uh, those are our landscapers and roofers who are out there working on our land, mowing our grass in 100 degree heat. Um, that, uh, what about those? How many do we have of those? You know, the need is several million people. Uh, the, the reality is, is how many visas? Who said that? Well, there you go. What's your name? Jessica. Jessica, how do you know? Ah, you cheated. <laughs> okay, so, you know, we have the, 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 what's allocated to the category is 66,000 visas. So the employer who comes to, and, and those visas are gone pretty much the day the quota opens as well. And w what the government has done is they separated those visas in two parts. 33,000 available October 1, and 33 available April 1. On April 1, I have a bunch of employers who are standing in line to file, on F, uh, to file their, uh, let me tell you how H2B visa works. What the, the American employee has to do to get one of those H2B visas for one of its workers. Uh, be comfortable in your chairs, it's going to take for a while. <laughs> At least four months before, and, they, and it has to be exactly four months before because they can't file any earlier than that. They have to file a prevailing wage determination with the, Dep with the Department of Commerce in Kansas. Then they have to apply for a temporary labor certification for their H-2B workers with the Department of, Kansas, uh, of Commerce in Kansas. Then they have to receive recruitment instructions and they have to advertise in a newspaper or major publication in the area, such as Kansas City Star and Kansas City. Then they have to meticulously recruit and they must send a certified letter to absolutely every person who applies for any job, including mowing. And then they have to chase a person with at least additional two phone calls. And when they um, interview them, they have to take meticulous notes and then they have to file the labor certification, and if it's approved in Kansas, it goes on to the Department of Labor. Then if that's approved, it goes to immigration in the form of an H-2B petition. And if that's approved, then it goes to the consulate, then we deal with the consulate. Are you tired? That's to get your landscapers. It costs a tremendous amount of money for each petition, several thousand dollars plus attorney fees. And my um, clients who are Kansas businesses say this to people who challenge that, of course, there are American workers who want those jobs. <laughs> they, wanna, they tell me, you know, if there were American workers who want to mow the lawn or to, to, to roof my roofs at the prevailing wage, they are not being paid low wages. The prevailing wage is determined by the Department of Kansas to make sure these, these are not cheap labor, so they determine the wage and it's usually higher than what's on the market. Um, they would tell me, Mira, would we go through all this trouble and spend all this money on bringing our workers from Guatemala, Mexico, South Africa, Ukraine, if we could just get them here? Absolutely not, it makes no sense whatsoever. And more importantly, 
So, and, and some of, uh, most of them don't get their workers. They go through the hoops and they spend their money, but because the visas are gone April 1, any employees who've gone through this exercise then should go and just buy a rope because they're not going to get their workers and they're forced to either close their business or do something else. Guess what? Right. Also, in most categories, there's simply, how about this? How many visas do we have for commercial cleaners, meat processing plant workers, people who wash dishes in the restaurants? Nancy? Yes? 44,000. Bob says 44,000. Nancy? Did you, ha did you have a number? No? You're not Nancy? Oh, sorry. Zero. zero. What's your name? Janet Benson. Janet Benson. Oh. Benson says zero, and Bob says 44,000. Let's vote. Who is right? Who votes for Bob? <laughs> I'm sorry. I think you're outvoted. Who votes for Janet Benson? Zero is correct. We have zero visas for most categories of workers. So no matter how hard the meat, pla meat processing uh, plant owner or the owner of a hotel or the owner of the company who cleans uh, Missouri Capital wants to hire them legally, they can't. Those visas don't exist. There are zero of them. So you either should not be in business period, and our restaurants should serve dirty dishes, and we should not have cleaners in this uh, university, and we should not have any meat, which I'm a vegetarian. I can do it. What about you? <laughs> um, so that's what we have. We have a need of several million people. We have meager allocation for non-immigrant visas, and we have zero allocation for most of the workforce that is needed per Bernanke, per Greenspan, per, per major economists who actually operate with facts. There's a little article that I enclosed here um, on Bernanke, what he said, and you can look at this. Also, um, a little article on the Social Security uh, non-match fund of $7 billion, which is called Social Security is about math, not Mexicans. So I think we need to switch from why do they come why do they come illegally? Well, what do they want? Do we have to take all the poor people from the world to what do we need? What does America need? What is good for America? And let's look at numbers versus let's just go all up in arms and be emotional just because they're different and we don't like them. I think if we switch to that kind of thinking, maybe we can arrive at some solutions to the immigration problem. And maybe we can arrive to a solution where we actually know who is coming into the country. And we can actually be safe. And if we have enough visas for workers, enough visas for um, families, we can control who is coming, who is not. We can have most of the jobs that need to be filled, filled. We can control the wages. We can control the human rights of those workers. Because now they have none. When Larry called me and invited me kindly and said, Mary, you have to do a lecture on immigration and human rights. I was taken aback. And I said, well, this is going to be a very short lecture. Most immigrants in this country have absolutely no human rights. Your human rights are over at the time immigration comes. If you don't have legal status, you have zero human rights. It doesn't matter what happened to you. It doesn't matter that the employer didn't pay you well. It doesn't matter that the police didn't treat you well. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters. The only thing that matters is that you don't have an immigration status. So they'll shove you into a van, they'll take you into a jail, and off you go. Let's talk about family. I um, came from uh, Russia to the United States. 
and I was 26 years old, and I was very impressionable. Uh, <laughs> I then uh, you know, watched television, read newspapers, met many wonderful people. And uh, what is really amazed me about this country is when people started talking about family, family values, quality time with the kids. And I thought, wow, we never talk about such things back in Russia. You know, I'm so impressed with this country. And then, with time, I became an immigration lawyer, and I was completely shocked by seeing that things uh, like this happen. Let's look at, there's a yellow sheet of paper in your um, handout. And I want to ask you this question. This will be number two. It takes so many years for a wife and a kid of a U.S. permanent resident to come to the United States legally. Anybody knows off the top of your hand? If, if I have a green card and I marry somebody from abroad and uh, we have a kid, how many years will it take for me to legally bring that family back? And Kim, you're excluded because you're an immigration lawyer. No way you're going to answer that. Five years if you come from where? Europe. From Europe, yes. And 14 years if you come from, you don't know. Let's look at it. On page two, we have a little table here, right here. Okay. And let's look at 2A. Layla, Layla, I think that last person there yeah, needs a group, needs a group of Okay. Uh, 2A, and let's look at all countries except those listed. That would be your Europe. And what's your name, sir? Anil. Anil, okay. And you said five years. So, for example, you are a permanent resident from England, and you made a mistake of going back and, and marrying your sweetheart in England. Um, how long will she have to wait in England before she can come here? Anil, how long? Can you read to me 2A, all countries? What date do we have? Uh, yes, okay. So if you calculate a little bit, March 2007 minus March 2002, that British person who is a permanent resident of the United States, if he marries someone from Britain, she will have to stay home and wait until she can come here legally for five years. Okay, well, what about Let's say Mexico. Um, what date do we see for Mexico? What is it? August 15, 2000. So how many years? Seven years. So you are a permanent resident of the United States. You got your green card. You belong here. When you cross the border from abroad, they tell you, welcome home, sir. And you, let's say, go to Mexico and you marry, fall in love, and you marry this wonderful woman. And you know what young people do? She immediately gets pregnant. But then you are a, a good person, and you know, you tell her, let's go back to Manhattan, Kansas. It's a wonderful town. And let's just, you know, go back to Kansas and live there. You take her to the U.S. consulate. And because you want to apply for a visa, because you don't want to do anything illegal, right? Also, you don't want to do anything bad, such as you have a pregnant wife. You don't want to leave her, right? So you go to the consulate, but you have never been shown this uh, document, which is the visa bulletin. And you tell your, um, the consular officer, who is a U.S. consular officer right there, this is my wife, and she's pregnant, and we are happy, and we're doing everything legally, and we want to go back to my home country, which is the United States now. Um, and I, by the way, cannot stay in Mexico for a long time, because if I do that, they'll take away my green card. So I've got to go home as soon as possible and take my wife, pregnant wife, with me. And the consular officer looks at um, this person, and they do it maybe... 50, 60, 70 times a day. And he tells him, feel for your brother, but the visa bulletin says that she will have to stay behind in Mexico for about seven years. And there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Meanwhile, 
she is not eligible to come to the United States on any visitor or student or any work visa because she now is considered to be an intending immigrant. So under our law, she is not allowed to even cross the border until she gets a green card in seven years from now. You know, when I learned that, I first couldn't understand it. You know, I was already a bar attorney. I passed two bars, and I so I was so smart. My God, scared. And I thought, well, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't admit that I can't understand it to myself or to my colleagues. So I was just, you know, when a senior attorney explained it to me, I said, well, oh, I understand, I understand. But then I went to my office and I said, well, I don't understand. You know, this, I don't know how to read this. It cannot be that a family, by law, should be separated. This is biblical and sick, like seven years for Rachel, you know that it has to be that way. And I went back and asked the senior attorney, what are you talking about? And she looked at me and said, yeah, why do you think we have all this illegal smuggling of family members across the border? Many of that is caused by this, that a person has to be either a cad and separated from his family for all these years. They can be in Mexico because they lose their green card. They belong here. This is their homeland now. And they can bring their wife and children here. So a lot of illegal immigration is caused in addition to the, the absence of uh, work visas and availability of jobs here by this horrible anti-family immigration policy. Anti-family, which does not become the United States. That is not a good value for this country. And now that I'm a citizen of this country, my opinion is that this is wrong. We should be a country of family values. This should not be. If you are married to somebody who belongs here, who is a citizen, or who has a green card, who is welcomed as one of ours when he comes home from abroad, they should be able to go through a reasonable process, I don't know, six months, to bring their family here, not seven years. And by the way, uh, all these uh, conversations about let's, de let's deport them, let's just, you know, they're, they don't belong here. Um, El Centro is an organization in Kansas City um, that is um, in the middle of the Hispanic community. Every year they do a study. One of the studies they do is to see how interconnected the families are. And every year they show, and this year they, sh they showed that approximately 78% of uh, undocumented persons in the United States, in, in the Kansas City area, have at least one member of their core family, wife, husband, mother, brother, children, who are United States citizens. So by deporting them, um, what we're doing is we are either deporting the whole family or breaking the family forever again. I think I'm a little bit of out of time, and I can go on, or I can take questions. Um, uh, I think I'll tell you one more um, slide, and then I'll, I think I'll take questions. Um, in my fabulous cookbook, um, there are wonderful recipes. However, there are three kinds of recipes that didn't make it to the cookbook. One is a client of mine who is a, a Kansas woman, and she has several generations of uh, Kansas in her family. Originally, the family came from England. And uh, uh, that was the beginning of the century. Her grand-grandfathers <coughs> came, through the, uh, came through and settled. Then the law was changed where the, the immigrants had to go through Ellis Island. And that's where we began our um, bending our law to, to more exclusion of immigrants. And one of those things was, well, who can we exclude? Of course, we can exclude the homosexuals, the Chinese, uh, very racist. And of course, who else can we exclude? Single women, because why would they come to the United States? Why being single? Take a wild guess. Of course, they're going to be prostitutes. So if, to come through Ellis Island, if you were a single woman, you had to come with a father, a brother, 
um, or a, you know, a, an adult relative to vouch for you that you are not one, one of those terrible hostages. In this family, it, uh, you know, the, the, the woman in the family, the single sister, adult sister, there were no parents anymore. And it was hardship for the brothers who were in Kansas to, at that time, travel all the way to New York to claim her from Ellis Island. So the family concocted a plan. Now, my client initially told me, you know, Mira, I I'm going to give you an, an, an apple pie for your uh, cookbook. I said, Wonderful. But also, I asked them for stories. You know, how did your family come? How did you come? And she started telling me the story. And that's where we parted ways. Because what she told me about her grand grandmother is all this outrageous stuff. And then she said, well, you know, they couldn't go get her, so she came through Canada, and then she came to Kansas on her own. And I looked her in the eye, and I said, well, does it mean she came illegally? Yeah, she did, because the law was stupid. OK, so she violated our immigration law by, by just brushing it aside. She was not willing to put her family through just because I'm a woman and they presume I'm a prostitute. They have to come and claim me. She did something more reasonable, went through Canada who, that had more reasonable immigration laws. And then, yes, she violated the law and she came down to the United States illegally and settled. And now they are fifth or sixth generation Kansas. And my client, who offered me an apple pie initially, refused to be in the book. She's my business client. We work on work visas for her workers. And she didn't want to be associated with an ancestor who came here illegally. My second um, recipe, not in the book, is from my refugee clients. And, uh, you know, I asked them to give me a recipe and to give me a story. And I asked them to please give me an, a, a chance to write about what they had to go through. And there was a Somali family that had to go through horrible, horrible things. But none of my refugee clients wanted to say anything about how hard it was. They only wanted to talk about good stuff and how wonderful the life is and how wonderful their life in America, and even the past is. So we don't have any bad stories. It's all wonderful, cheerful stuff in the cookbook, even though you could only, you, can, you, you, know, you can't imagine what some of the people in the book went through. On our refugee policy, I wanted to, uh, have, you're probably busy with, you know, exams are coming up, but you probably listen to national public radio and read newspapers. Recently, there was uh, um, some materials about Anne Frank's father on NPR, and he tried to get the family out of uh, uh, Europe when it was clear that the Jews are being grounded and being killed. He tried to do his best. He was not, uh, he was, uh, he failed to secure visas to go anywhere in the world. And also, I looked up some research. There were many, many Jews who tried to escape death in concentration ca camps um, in Europe mm, uh, during the, the, the Hitler time. One of the examples is a steamship St. Louis, where over 900 people on board were Jews from Austria and Germany who secured um, visas to go to Cuba. When they arrived in Cuba, they were turned away. Then the ship went to Miami in the hope that the Americans will take and the Americans did not take them. So 900 Jews all went back. Most of them died in concentration camps. Our refugee policy is just like that now. I don't take any more refugee cases in my office because I cannot anymore see solid, horrible claims where people were taught, tortured, where they had knives in their uh, bodies denied, because we don't want refugees anymore. Our approval rate on solid immigration, uh, refugee claims is less than 15%. And you should read a report uh, on our immigration, uh, on our uh, refugee policy from US Commission on International Religious Freedom. That will make your hair stand up. It is exactly 
like our conduct when we turn uh, steamship St. Louis away from our shores and we send those people back to their death. This is our immigration policy in terms of refugees and it's horrible. My last thing is VAWAs, which is cases we take from uh, battered immigrants, spouses and uh, children. Also, they are not in the book because it's not safe for them to be in the book. Sadly, Violence Against Women Act is our best part of our immigration policy. <laughs> Everything else in our immigration law pretty much sucks. The only good part is the one dedicated to better spouses. And if the better spouse actually can get to an immigration attorney who knows how Violence Against Women Act applies, we can, in most cases, help them. The problem, of course, is that um, 83% of battered immigrant women never, never even call the police. Very few of them get to the shelters and very few of them know that Violence Against Women Act covers them and that's uh, uh, um, a bad problem. But, you know, if you know someone, tell them, get them to an immigration attorney, we can help. Um, I think um, this will be the last one for sure. Um, you know who met Bob, uh, Bob. <laughs> or Ben, what's your name? Ben, Ben, right? Okay, you probably read some Madeleine Albright's books. I read it once. Yeah, by M Madeleine Albright. I know she is, but I haven't read it. Oh, very good. <laughs> Who read her memoirs? Madeleine Albright? Anybody here? Okay. Well, you know, like, uh, since I don't have anything better to do, <laughs> I read a lot. And so I read her memoirs recently. She, her family were, uh, Madeleine Albright is our former Secretary of State. And uh, um, she, I think, was our one of, not the, Brzezinski was first, but she was the first woman Secretary of State. And also her family were refugees from Europe that came during World War II um, and applied for refugee status, was initially denied, but then granted. So she kind of knows the family went through this thing. And she became our Secretary of State and, and was uh, a colorful one. And in her book, um, she said something that really moved me. She said that, uh, uh, you know, being an immigrant, I can tell you that there are no bigger patriots of this country than those who came from somewhere else and made it its homeland. And that's what I think. Thank you. And for good, thank you, Larry. And for good questions, we still have some cookbooks and some of Layla's books to give out, too. <laughs> and, and after the questions, by the way, we have a, uh, well, we do have a reception. We do not have a reception. Okay. Keep asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Politically, what do we do with all these Iraqi translators that have helped our forces? Well, you know, like everything in immigration policy, it's not logical, it's sporadic, and if it hits the media and then somehow there's going to be a scandal on the Hill, something will be done. This kind of hit the media, and there were hearings on the Hill, and Congress, and that also uh, is amazing how these things come up. Suddenly they decided we're going to allocate 5,000 refugee visas to these Iraqi translators. Why is it 5,000? We don't know. Maybe there's more than 5,000 refugee uh, translators. What if there's 6,000? Then we're going to cut, you know, cut the, the 6,000 out. And second of all, um, so yes, to answer your question, something has been done, the allocation has been made, but we don't know um, how efficient the process will be because it's the same asylum officers who are deciding claims of clients I no longer take who will be applying the law and deciding whether um, these people are refugees or not. But can we respond rapidly enough to get them out of harm's way? Is it processing 
I think if there's a will, there's a way. Uh, I'm not sure that there's a will. And, you know, it's, it's a problem elsewhere in the world as well, not just the United States. Um, I, I, I'm aware of who wants refugees. In Europe, there's currently just one country, Sweden, that is basically taking most refugees from uh, uh, Iraq. Everybody else has closed the doors, and some countries even deported refu Iraqi refugees back, saying, well, Saddam is no longer there, it's sick. That's crazy, and that's going on right now. Yes. Sure. I think the first step, and that's an excellent question. What's your name? Jonathan. Jonathan. Um, I, I think it's an excellent question, and I think the best, best way of dealing with, with assimilation is by, uh, by making sure people in the immigrant, so immigrant societies are legal. Because if you're living an underground life where you're afraid, um, to be, to know anyone, to talk to anyone, where you hide all the time, where you don't even have a driver license, where you can't go to class, where you can't go to college, where your kids have to also s huddle with the other, uh, you know, uh, I illegal immigrants. That's the worst way to assimilate, and that's what we're doing. You know, we have enclaves of uh, uh, especially Hispanic immigrants right here in Kansas where people are just afraid to go anywhere else. That's what they do. Uh, the best way would be to um, allow for an orderly legalization for those who are not criminals, for those who are here just to work or to be with family. And uh, um, yes, invite them into the society, invite them to be a part of our schools, universities, uh, public, cl you know, English classes. We know that with El Centro and some other organizations providing free English classes, they have lists um, of you know, hundreds of people who are unable to, um, to receive, uh, want to, but unable to receive English classes uh, and have to wait for months and months and years in order to get um, into those classes. So, you know, it's very interesting. Kansas and Missouri and all the other states, you know, they would, you know, <laughs> go about legislation. Let the, the English language be the official language of the state. Yeah, well, that would be nice, wouldn't it? But then, what are we doing about it? I think we need to then maybe, um, you know, fund some English classes, maybe uh, uh, make people unscared <laughs> of our culture. It's interesting to look at this, you know, if people are legal, and in most cases, if they're not as scared, the second generation integrates really fast. My four-year-old daughter, when we moved to London, about, who didn't speak a word of English, six months later, approximately, told me while we were working on Oxford Street, Mom, you're embarrassing me. Stop speaking Russian to me. It only took her about six months. Um, yeah, and you should see, uh, you know, the second generation, the kids, being very integrated. 